Shall we rise up as we pray together? Father, we do thank you once again for bringing us safe and sound to the Bible study tonight. Thank you for all our brothers and sisters, all our young people, everyone here, and in all the locations where we're hearing your word tonight. Lord, we pray through this teaching of the word, you strengthen us for the hour of trial and temptation in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, the spirit of the conqueror that triumphs over temptation, trial, and trouble. Lord, we pray you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. In the home where the Christian wife is suffering, in the home where the Christian believer, the husband, might be suffering, in the home where the children who believe in the Lord might be persecuted in the place of work, where the pressures of persecution may be there, in the community where your people are facing the fire of persecution of this day, Lord, we pray tonight you strengthen everyone in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, that you will not bow or bench under what, whatever kind of persecution. That, Lord, will be standing firm for you till the very end in Jesus' name. Holding fast the word of faith, the word of truth, which you have taught us. That, Lord, in every community, darkness will be dispelled before us. And the light will shine for us through us. And the people of the world, through your power, your protection, and through your glory in our lives, they will know that we have been with the Lord. Strengthen your people tonight, O Lord. And help us, Lord, when that hour comes, when we have to declare who we are, whom we serve. Lord, we pray, we will not cringe, will not be crushed, will not be conquered. I will be standing firm in the grace of the Lord, in the strength of the Spirit of the Lord, in Jesus' name. Be with everyone, Lord. Help us to become stronger as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3 tonight. And once again, I welcome every one of you. I praise the Lord for those who are coming for the first time. And I pray that the study of the world will be beneficial to every one of you and every one of us in Jesus' name. In Daniel chapter 3, that is the king, the emperor, a tyrant, an idol worshiper, calling the whole nation, the whole dominion, the whole realm, all the places where he had any authority and any contact, calling them that he should come and worship the idol that he had set up. And the people were so afraid and so intimidated because he threatened them. He said, anybody that will not listen to him, anybody that will not fall down and worship his idol at that same hour, he'll be caught and then he'll be thrown into the burning fire. If one is of fire, then he said to these ones that will not beg, that will not bow, that will not give any attention to what he had said. He said, who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand? That was a great question. A question he shouldn't have asked, even in his, uh, in his wildest imagination, to challenge the God of heaven. That was a great thing coming out of the mouth of a creature on earth. And the Lord answered him by great, great manifestation of his majesty, glory, and power. That's what we're looking at tonight. I want you to look at Daniel chapter 3, and I'm reading verse 15. Now, if ye be ready, at what time ye hear the sound of the carnage, flute, harp, sackbut, satry, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, he fall down and worship the image which I have said, which I have made well. What he meant by that is, I'll pardon you for your foolishness of the past, for not bowing down when I told you to bow down. If you will reconsider and then turn around and then you change your mind and change your decision and you bow down to worship my idol, that will be all right. I'll just overlook what happened in the past. Then you said, but if ye worship not, 
he shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? That was the question he asked. It was the time of his madness, spiritual madness. It was a time of foolishness for him, spiritual foolishness. For him to ask a question like that, even to think about something like that, to allow the thought in your mind, to challenge the Almighty God. He was looking for trouble. He got it eventually. Some kinds of questions naturally provoke God to action. Such questions might intimidate fearful uh, people, but such questions embolden the people who are full of faith and they are faithful to their God. What a question he asked. It is a question that always provokes divine action. A question that produces supernatural miracle. A question that demands the manifestation of God's supremacy and God's extraordinary power. When unbelieving despots, tyrants, wicked people, when they ask such questions, God always responds to protect his own glory and then to silence such blasphemers. And then, you know what the people of God said? They said, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us out of your hand. I, I want to tell you that God has not changed. Today, he is still able. When persecutors threaten you, when idol worshippers threaten you, when evil people threaten you, whether they threaten you with words or with action, whether they threaten you with their look or with their machinery, whatever it is, when the wicked people of the world, when they threaten you so that they can bend your will, bow your mind, make you fall down and worship them or worship their image, you can stand like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you can declare, my God for my son is able to deliver me and he will deliver me. And so eventually, when they answered him like that, he became more furious, became very much angry. And then that's what we're reading today. He threw them into the fire. See what happened. I'm reading from chapter 3, verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. And the form of his face changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was once to be heated. He was very angry. In his anger he lost his senses. He wanted to punish the people and he wanted the punishment to be very serious, to be very painful. Well, didn't you know that if you hit the furnace seven times hotter and you throw the people inside, they should die instantly. It will lessen the moment of their pain. It will lessen the period of their pain. His anger got into his brain and he forgot that. So you see when people are angry, they forget their intention. And they forget the very purpose. But that's what he did. In verse 20, and he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to buy Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And to cast them into the burning fairy furnace. Wonderful that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not even resist. Neither did they cry. Neither did they complain. Neither did they begin to pray a kind of prayer they had never prayed before. They were calm, they were composed, they were patient, they were peaceful, looking for what God will do. Then in verse 21, these men were bound in their coats, and their hosing, and their hearts, and their other garments, and were cast into the, into the midst of the burning fairy furnace. Therefore, in verse 22, because the king's commandment was very, was urgent. And the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar lost some of his mighty men. The people that fight against the children of God, they are the people that will suffer. But the children of God, 
will still remain alive. Even in the fire, even in the persecution, we're going to still remain alive in Jesus' name. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bowed into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then the goodness of the king was astonished. He was surprised, shocked, and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bowed into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men bowed, lying down, loose, and walking in the midst of the fire. We can walk in the midst of the fire. Whatever fire this world is building up, whatever persecution, fairy persecution, this world is trying to make, and whatever instrument this world is trying to use to destroy your life, you can stand erect and walk and looking up as a person that has seen the glory of God. And you will walk in that fire in Jesus' name. It says, and they have no heart. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then the Kadnezah came near to the mouth of the bony, furry furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. You know now he said, God is the most high God. He realized, not even up to one day now, when he challenged God, just a few hours, that he challenged God. And then he knew that these Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were not just children of God, they were servants of the most high God. And he told them to come forth, and they came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, and the governors, and the captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Nor was there, was any air, was an air of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed. Nor the smell of the fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel. And deliver the servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language who shall speak anything amiss against the gods of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be caught in pieces and their houses shall be made. They don't heal because there is no other God that can deliver after their sort. Amen. Yeah. He confessed it eventually. He was conquered. God will conquer every enemy. Yeah. Every persecutor. The Lord will conquer them in Jesus' name. What happened to these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? After passing the test, after going through the furnace of fire, after taking an uncompromising stand, after living through the persecution, what then happened to them? Bastachi. Then the king did what? Promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. That is what the Lord is revealing to us. And the Lord is proving to us that He is able. If anyone challenges God in your life, that's the time for you to prove that the promises of God are still yes and amen. And you'll come out and come through triumphantly in Jesus' name. We're dividing the message tonight, the study tonight, to three parts. Number one, the persecution of non-conformists in the fairy furnace. The persecution of non-conformists in the fairy furnace. Number two, the protection of new creatures in the fairy furnace. The protection of new creatures in the fairy furnace. Number three, the promotion of noble conquerors after fearless faithfulness. The promotion of noble conquerors after fearless faithfulness. 
We're looking at number one, the persecution of nonconformists in the very funnies. These men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, actually they were young men, and they were faithful. We call them non-conformists. Who are the non-conformists? The people that will not conform to the principles of this world. Who are the non-conformists? The people that will not conform to the practices of this world. Who are the non-conformists? The people that say no to the world. In Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's what they did. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, if we have to defend the truth of our very body, if we have to defend our conviction with our very life, if we have to defend what we are standing for with our very existence, that will do. Lord, we give our body to you as a sacrifice, if it need be. Those are the people who can stand in the time of persecution. But you know the people that perch, pamper themselves, and the people that care too much about themselves, they're not willing to sacrifice anything. They're the people, they're like the jellyfish. They have no backbone, and they cannot stand. But you know the people who say, I don't care for anything. If I have it all right, if I don't have it all right, my time, my life, my body, everything, I'm willing to sacrifice so that I can defend the truth and the glory of the Lord. Those are the people that are victorious, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not what? Conform. Those are the non-conformists. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're looking at three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They proved what is the perfect, acceptable will of God. By not conforming unto the world, persecution will come. But God loves faithful, uncompromising believers. Not conformists who refuse to be conformed to this world are God's delight. Yet we must remember that the world and the God of this world, they hate whatever and whoever God loves. Nebuchadnezzar, the gentile king, was enraged by the refusal of these three faithful people to worship his image. In his rage, he, he made a strange and cruel scene, a kind of punishment that never anybody had seen in the world. And these simply servants of God remained calm, patient, constant, peaceful in their devotion to God. They knew that God had power to deliver them from death, or if he desired, he could take them to a better place than this world. He could deliver them from the despot forever. Because of that, they took their stand. And this Nebuchadnezzar the king, he was furious, was very angry, and a great intensity of the heat of his fury could not be satisfied without a great intensity of heat in the furnace. His anger was visible because we're told he in his rage was full of fury and the form of his appearance, countenance, visage changed. He was betrayed in the whole comportment and the countenance, through that countenance, he ordered that the heat of the furnace be increased to the highest possible degree. Passion over doors and defeats its own end, its own goal, its own purpose. Because the hotter the fire, the sooner were they likely to be put out of pain. But eventually, that's what he commanded. We need not be frightened by the rage, by the anger, by the fury, by the device of the persecutors. And you know, sometimes when you see people who are angry, then you become afraid. That's their nature. That's their nature. Dogs will bark, that's his nature. And the lions will roar, that's their nature. And the birds will fly, that's their nature. And sinners will get angry, that's alright, that's their nature. Sinners will sin, 
And when you don't please them, they'll show the anger. And so it shouldn't surprise you. What makes us a surprise is when you're looking for a sinner to be nice. And you're looking for an idol worshiper to be gentle. And you're looking for a Nebuchadnezzar to be calm and peaceful and loving. You're looking for, you're looking for something impossible. That's why we become shocked. But we need not be frightened of the rage or the fury or the device of the persecutors. After all, the persecution cannot burn us, cannot destroy us, cannot crush us. In that persecution, only what they used to bind us will burn away. Persecution purifies. Persecution preserves the true children of God. Persecution revives the dormant faith in, the, in some promises of God that have been forgotten. Persecution brings God's omnipotence and faithfulness nearer in manifestation. Uh, persecution drives us to prayer and persecution makes us to now depend on God more, more than ever before. Now I want to ask you a question. Who was the persecutor here? Who? Nebuchadnezzar. I'm asking another question now, but don't answer. I'll show you in the Bible. Who are the persecutors today? Because Nebuchadnezzar is gone. And many of us will not get to any king, any emperor. Many of us will not get to, to live with any president to persecute us. Who are the persecutors today? And let's look at Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 21 and verse 22. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Those are the persecutors today. Number one, they could be parents that will deliver their children to death. They'll say, I wish the child will die. He's gone away from the religion in which he was born. It's going to take the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And so the father or the mother or the two together, they may persecute. Not only that, relatives or relations may persecute. Because it says, and the brother shall deliver brother to death. You know, sometimes it's your own brother, it's your own sister, it's the same person you are born out of the same place. That will persecute you because now you are following the Lord and it's shocking them that you are not following the family idol anymore. Sometimes it's the child that will persecute the parent. Jesus said so. Look at verse 21. It says, and the children shall rise up against their 